All right, we're now ready to discuss rigid transformations. In the first couple of videos, we'll talk about rigid transformations in general. And then we'll roll out the armored tank division of component spaces and really go to town on them. So the word rigid in rigid transformations is inspired by rigid bodies. These are bodies that are characterized by the property that we can't change their shape no matter what we do to them. An alternative characterization is that the distances between any two points remain unchanged under the transformation. So I'm once again holding one of my favorite sculptures by Gary Zayon, and even though it has a little bit of flexibility to it, we'll ignore it, and think of it as a rigid body. Now this particular rigid body has the added advantage that it looks very different from all the different angles, so we can easily tell its orientation just by looking at it. So that's what makes it such an excellent prop for this demonstration. Now, if this body weren't rigid, we could do a whole lot more to it. We could bend it and twist it and do all other kinds of things to it. But we can't because it's rigid. Nevertheless, we can still do a whole lot to it. Just pay attention to the complexity of the transformations that we can impose on it. And then there is a category of rigid transformations that I can't even physically perform on this body, and it has to do with reflections, and we'll talk about it in just a moment. Now, there's tremendous complexity, and of course our goal is to break down this complexity into more elementary, simpler transformations. And there are, broadly speaking, three categories of these simpler, more elementary transformations. We have rotations, translations, and reflections. So let's start with rotations. Let me give you a definition of what a rotation is. A rotation is a rigid transformation where at least, not at least, <laughs> let me start from the beginning. A rotation is a rigid transformation where one point remains where it is, does not move in the course of the transformation, under the transformation. So you can see that even this more narrow category of transformations still has tremendous complexity. And earlier we asked how many parameters do you need to capture an orientation even if we know the location of one of the points? The answer will be three. And we'll also show that no matter how complicated a rotation is, so for example we might go from this to this, it is always equivalent to a simple rotation with respect to some fixed axis. So even though I don't know where it is for this particular rotation, I know that I could have chosen an axis that of course passes through that fixed point, where a single rotation with that axis remaining stationary, so something like that, would have delivered that orientation. So that gives you a glimpse of why the number of parameters that you need is three, because you need to specify the axis, and that takes longitude and latitude. Just think of it as being at the center of the Earth pointing to the surface of the Earth. So knowing the longitude and latitude, you know exactly what point it points to. And then you also need the angle of rotation. So that, that's one of the perspectives that tells you that three is the answer. Well, in any case, all of that will come later. Uh, but that's it for now for rotations. That's what rotations are. And I think we'll spend most of our time talking about rotations. The other two are simpler in a way. Let's talk about translations now. So here's what a translation is, a very straightforward transformation where every point moves by the same amount or more accurately by the same vector. And the thing about translations is that no matter how you look at them, that's not a linear transformation. Just because every point moves, so the origin needs to move also. So we'll spend a little bit more time on that also, but I think it's pretty clear even right now that translations are not linear transformations. And if a transformation is not linear, you cannot represent it in component spaces by matrix multiplication. If you use the same procedure that we usually use for constructing the matrix, you'll end up with something nonsensical that doesn't do what you want it to do. So that's kind of a bummer. But you will see that with a nice trick that augments the dimension of what's going on, we'll actually 
we actually will be able to express translations by matrix multiplication. And that's one of the things to look forward to. All right, so that's translations. Actually, one more thing I would like to mention about translations is that it, you have to think about it very strictly as something that really shifts the body parallel to itself. These are parallel translations. If you turn the body just a little bit as you're translating it, that's already closer to a rotation than a translation. In fact, if you move it about this much and then you rotate it just a little bit, there's probably a point way down there that didn't move because first it moved along with translation and then this rotation sort of brought it back. So there was one point that didn't move, so it's more like a rotation than a translation. So when we say translation, let's think strictly parallel translation. Okay? Now a few words about reflections. So to me, reflections are still mysterious. Even though I've been looking in the mirror uh, since I was a little child, there's still a little bit of a mystery to that whole anti-world behind the mirror. Uh, there are many paradoxes associated with mirrors, or I presume there are many paradoxes, but the one that I'm still trying to wrap my mind around is the fact that mirrors turn our left hands into right hands and our right hands into left hands when we look in the mirror. And then the question is, how does the mirror know about left and right? Because left and right and up and down has to do with gravity. And of course, and our perception of gravity. But of course, a piece of glass with silver paint on the back of it uh, doesn't know about gravity. So how does it know to flip the image this way and not this way? You can look on, the, on YouTube for a video by Richard Feynman, an interview. He describes this question and gives an explanation that seems very simple, having to do that while well, mirror doesn't flip left and right, it flips front and back and we just perceive it as left and right. So on the one hand, that explanation convinces me. On the other hand, I'm still a little bit confused. So in any way, I think, in any case, I think it's a very interesting transformation to think about and this and many other questions are very interesting. So that's what a reflection is. This is what, in what a mirror does. Very simple to describe, maybe not so easy to fully comprehend. Now let me make a few general notes. I'm gonna put the sculpture down and make a couple notes. And here's the first note. Even though I put it down prematurely, even though we're, th we're thinking about transforming bodies of finite size, we're actually transforming the entire space. And we only use that body as a way of nicely telling us what we're doing to the whole space. But the whole space comes with the body in the rigid way. So we're not turning bodies, we're not rotating bodies. We're rotating the entire space. Every point moves from its original location to its new location under the transformation. So we're really moving every point of our three-dimensional or special case two-dimensional vector space. Okay, and because we're still doing linear algebra in the context of vector spaces, we have to put the whole thing in the proper vector context because we're not moving points, we're transforming vectors. Every transformation takes all the vectors and moves them somewhere. Take goes from the pre-image to the image of the vector. So we have to do it in a way consistent with, with how we see all of linear algebra and geometric vector spaces. In particular, there's an origin. So when we're saying that under some transformation, this point moved to this one, what we're really saying is that this vector under the transformation became this vector. So once again, we didn't just take this point and move it over here. We took this vector and transformed it into this vector. That's why a translation has no chance of being linear. Because what is a translation? A translation is something that adds a constant vector, let's call it C. So by definition, T of V, wrong place, T of V would be V plus C. Good, T for translation. So this would no longer be TV. Let me draw the vector C here. If that was V, 
This would be T V. T of V. And if this was W, then this would be, oops, missed it just a little bit. You see what I was going after? T of W. And importantly, well, that's because this is the vector C. Oh boy, I really missed it. <laughs> All right, let me correct it just, just to make it decent. All right, it should have gone right about that. Uh, still not good. All right. I'm just going to take my time. Is that a little better? Because I see it goes up a little bit. It's a little shorter. There we go. That's T of W. It really wasn't worth the effort. T of W. So importantly, the zero vector will end up somewhere over here. This right here would be T of the zero vector. And we know that all linear transformations always send the zero vector to the zero vector. That's one of the hallmark properties of linear transformations. So translations, unless we're shifting by the zero vector, has no chance of being a linear transformation. Similarly, if we consider a simple rotation, but the rotation doesn't take place with respect to the origin, let's say we're rotating with respect to this point right here, then it is not a linear transformation. Let's say it's rotation by 45 degrees. Then the origin would go, so let's see, that would be 90, 45 would be right around here. This would be the origin rotated. And it would become this vector right here. So once again, the zero vector becomes a non-zero vector. So a rotation with respect to this point is not a linear transformation. Yet, if you think about just the space and applications to computer graphics, or maybe it's the moon rotating and we're looking at it from the earth, you still want to be able to describe this transformation in the same framework. Well, the way we'll do it is as a combination of three transformations, a translation, a rotation, and another translation. Here's how we'll take it. We'll translate it to the origin. And as you know, with this trick, we'll be able to capture that by matrix multiplication. Then we'll rotate it here and then we'll move it back. So a translation, a rotation and a translation will be able to capture rotation with respect to this point. But the more fundamental point is that rotation with respect to this point is not a linear transformation. Similarly and finally, reflection, Unless it's with respect to in three dimensions and a plane, but in two dimensions a straight line passing through the origin is not a linear transformation. If you think back to our early discussions on linear transformations, then reflection with respect to a straight line passing through the origin was our perhaps first transformation we ever considered. Our first linear transformation was our hallmark linear transformation. And it is. But if it's reflection with respect to a line to this straight line, then once again, the zero vector will become this vector right here. Do you see how we're always tracking tips of vectors? So this is R, reflection, same letter, so I'll wiggle it. No longer the zero vector because this point becomes this point. So in other words, the zero vector becomes this vector. And it's clearly not a linear transformation. So at first, we'll limit our attention to linear transformations. Then we'll talk about translations and other nonlinear rigid transformations. So our first order of business is, uh, excuse me, rotations in the plane. And that's the subject of our next video. And you'll see that in the next video, we'll be able to say a whole lot about rotations without yet invoking component spaces.